And here we are in part three. God damn, this took a long time, especially considering this was supposed to be a one-part thing that was done before Justice League, and now it's a three-part thing finishing up over a month after Justice League got done fizzling at the box office, and Warner Brothers started openly talking about something like a reboot. Already. And I'll be honest, not what I was expecting. I sincerely thought the mere marketability of these characters on name alone would make this whole experiment sustainable. And now it feels as if that may not be the case. Which means that I might have spent a rather incredible amount of time and effort assembling a meticulous, perhaps even close to definitive, deconstruction of Batman v Superman, a movie that we're now very possibly just one flashpoint away from no one ever caring about again, which ultimately means this may well have been a gigantic waste of my time and yours, though I guess at a certain extent the final verdict on that is up to you people, the viewers, so hope you had a nice time. Seriously though, it is kind of incredible to have seen this all play out in real time. Very seldom do we get to. Usually when a movie or a studio production makes a bad bet and it falls apart, they manage to keep it out of the public eye so as not to remind investors of just how precarious the film business actually is to invest in. At the end of the day, you're paying for the glamour by association and possible cultural immortality, not for a stable place to grow your money. Though I guess it's still probably safer than Bitcoin, but don't tell anyone about that because watching a bunch of venture capital do bags lose their shirts all at once three to four years from now is something I'm expecting to be very, very entertaining. In any case, having performed a thorough autopsy on the devastating failure of Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, and also having explored the validity of the most common defenses of its indefensible badness, the places it goes wrong, the philosophy, the technique, the Batman, and the Superman, it is now time to talk about the heart of the matter, the director and the V. No, not that using a V instead of verses is stupid, though it is. I mean, it's time to discuss the main event. Warner Brothers bet big on Snyder's auteur sensibilities to give the DCEU a distinct flair apart from that of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and while the alchemy didn't totally come together, at all really, his stamp has been so distinctly left that even the DC films that will now go into production in the aftermath of all this are likely to be thematically unified by a shared sense of trying to purge themselves of his influence, for good or for ill. When all is said and done, Zack Snyder will probably have had influence over the popular perception of how the DC Universe superheroes are portrayed, as the likes of Frank Miller, Grant Morrison, Dennis O'Neill, Bruce Timm, Paul Dini, Christopher Nolan, or Lorenzo Semple Jr. even. So it's interesting to remember that while Warner Brothers ultimately gave him an impressively long leash for working out his vision in Batman v Superman and were apparently prepared to do the same for Justice League had he not been forced to vacate the project, the initial hiring for Man of Steel was widely seen as being based not on his vision or thematic approach, in fact the pitch and overall revised take on Superman mythos animating the project came from the Nolan Brothers, but rather his celebrated skill as an action director. Warner Brothers had absorbed the criticism that Superman was too hard to make movies about because superhero movies had to be action films first and foremost, and it's hard to figure out many exciting action scenes for a guy who can do anything at any time and wins every fight, he could typically take part in with very little effort, so it makes sense to hire an action specialist and structure the plot so that what's mostly a gloomy, angsty updating of the standard origin story detours for Act 3 and becomes Superman 2 by way of Dragon Ball Z. And while the ending left a bad taste in many people's mouths, it's hard to deny that Snyder was otherwise pretty good at the part of the job that probably got him hired, even if pairing with a scenario plotted out by the Nolan brothers otherwise didn't really suit his sensibilities. So you can say it made sense to follow up with a glossy, even more extreme film grounded entirely in his wheelhouse to the extent that the entire film would build up to and revolve around a single iconic fight scene. It just feels right, right? And yet, if you wanted an ultimate summation of Batman v Superman's abject artistic failure, it's that the epic superhero clash of the title is a complete drag and one of the worst things in it. You're not brave. One scene cannot save a bad movie. It can make a bad movie less bad, it can make an otherwise bad movie worth watching, but it can't save it. That having been said, if the movie exists in order to set up and execute one scene or sequence or plot points and you get that scene right, sometimes, yes, that can override the existence of the rest of the film and the collective cultural memory to such a degree that it might as well have saved it. For example, Legendary Pictures is in the midst of launching an entire cinematic universe for the 2014 version of Godzilla based entirely on the last 10 minutes of an otherwise largely forgettable movie and Ken Watanabe's delivery of the line 
Let them fight. I imagine you get where I'm going with this. Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is a terrible film where almost nothing works, nearly every storytelling decision is the wrong one, most of the acting is bad, the acting that's good doesn't actually do anything to help, and isn't particularly exciting or enjoyable to look at despite the Caligula's Rome level of unchecked expenditure, but it's also a film that, to be fair, is honest and upfront about advertising itself as a delivery system for a very specific event spectacle first, and a storytelling vehicle second. A fight between the two most famous and beloved superheroes probably ever is the main event, the title fight, literally a fight that is the title, also featuring the tentative first steps or dawn of the forming of the Justice League whatever that is. It's what they called the movie, it's what we're paying to see, it's what the whole story builds up to and then explodes out from, and if the film had delivered on that and only that, even if the rest of it still sucked, it's very possible we wouldn't be talking about the film this way, you wouldn't be watching this episode, and the entire landscape of popular culture vis-a-vis -vis film and comics would be substantially different today. Because just as bad execution overrides good intent, good execution where it counts can absolutely override poor execution where it counts less, and, even though it's practically a cardinal sin of my profession to admit this, the long-term experience of absorbing and remembering the essence of a piece of art will always ultimately override the immediate first-hand experience of watching it. That's how it works. Remember that the DC Extended Universe is viable at all as of this writing, of this paragraph at least, fun fact, no, this is not all being written and recorded in chronological order, is owed almost entirely to global audiences going so nuts for everything in Wonder Woman between No Man's Land and that village scene, and also Princess Buttercup showing up looking like she was ready to challenge for the UFC bantamweight belt. Holy shit, that was unexpected. <laughs> that nobody really cares all that much, that that movie kind of runs out of gas after that part, and the ending is kind of a dud. Doesn't matter, delivered where it counted, moms and sisters and daughters and little girls the world over went nuts for it, and if global audiences had come staggering out of Batman v Superman with nothing on their minds more prominently than, holy shit, can you believe how amazingly incredible it was to see Batman fighting Superman? Whole different ball game. Sadly, the fight pretty much sucks balls. <laughs> It would be almost funny if it wasn't so sad for everyone involved. This is the one thing they had to get right, and compared to a lot of the other things going on here, it's not really the hardest one to get your head around, or at least it shouldn't be. I mean, thematics and narrative, balancing tone and structure, characterization and plot progression, symbolism and subtext, that's the hard stuff. That's where the homework and the tricky collaborations and the tough decision-making comes in. But a big, effects-heavy fight scene between two dudes who've both done competent action movies before this, overseen by a director who might be better at fighting than he is at anything else, with Warner Brothers foot in the bill for damn near whatever stunts, props, sets, effects, etc. they decided they needed, and after longer than most other movies worth of setup, what they deliver is... Eight minutes in which Batman sets off two traps, Superman uses his heat vision once, they shove each other around a bit, Superman uses his most godlike power, i.e. the ability to fly, exactly once, Batman breaks out the magic gas that puts them more or less on equal footing, so we can pretty much drop the whole gadgets versus powers thing, which happens to be the main reason it's hypothetically interesting for these two people to fight, but okay. They just wrestle like two regular, slightly stronger than normal guys for a little bit, then haha, he hit him with an actual sink, wouldn't that be clever if this wasn't the exact wrong moment to start doing jokes and also didn't highlight that he hasn't actually been hitting him with everything but the kitchen sink up to this point. Toilets are always funny. And then drops him down a hole, does a monologue, swings him around on a rope, tries to harpoon him, and then doesn't because Martha. The end. What does that mean? Why did you say that name? Who boy. So, a lot went wrong here, but most of it ties back to stuff we've talked about ad nauseum in terms of the awkward performances, the overblown score, the dingy cinematography, the portentous screenwriting, and the weirdly inconsistent effects. And also, yeah, it, it's kind of a boring fight scene. There's a couple cool visuals, a couple of cool shots and individual moments, but it's not appreciably better or more visually interesting than brawling with the other Kryptonians in Man of Steel was. And yeah, execution is everything, but honestly, who heard the words Batman versus Superman and immediately thought, oh boy, I hope I get to see them just 
trade regular punches and some tackles in a random abandoned building. And like I said a moment ago, what's really bizarre is that a promised battle between Batman and Superman is in such a hurry to not feel like either Batman or Superman are participating in it. The abilities that make Superman more than just a tall, reasonably in-shape guy get neutralized almost immediately, while Batman's supposedly character-defining resourcefulness and preparation skills get boiled down to a suit of armor that facilitates the aforementioned generic wrestling, a handful of weapons, and a conceptually clever but eye-rolling and execution payoff where we're supposed to assume he planned to get his ass kicked around the building for a lot of the fight in order to make sure it all ended up with Superman landing right near where he put the spear at the beginning. Yeah, no, doesn't work even with Lex Luthor's even more implausible master plan on hand for comparison. This is also dumb, in the bad way. This fight was the whole enchilada, the thing they correctly focused on as the goal and centerpiece of their entire endeavor, the one thing they had to make as awesome as possible, and it could have taken hundreds of conceivable forms. Kryptonite Batarangs, the guy who can fly versus the Batwing, the master of stealth versus the guy who can see through walls, hell, even just a comically endless succession of Superman uses this power, oh come on, Batman has a specific counter for that in his utility belt too, would be both funny and appropriate. I mean, why even do a fight between these two guys if you're not going to do I can do everything versus I thought of everything. This isn't like Wolverine versus Hulk or Superman versus Captain Marvel where you actually want to work out who can outfight and or overpower the other. In narrative terms, it's not even a personality driven worldview divide like Captain America versus Iron Man in Civil War. Your lawless vigilantism does not arbitrarily conform to post Miranda police engagement protocol and I care about that now because a lady on TV made me feel bad about myself versus I had a very scary dream recently is not some kind of timeless archetypal philosophical debate to settle through exaggerated symbolic avatars here. And even if it was, it's not necessary because you've already got a much better ready-made clash of worldviews between Superman's traditional the world is innately decent so heroism is to observe and when necessary intervene to thwart the indecent variations versus no, the world is unfair and only constant vigilance and intimidation of evil keeps it in order coming out of Batman that's been the core difference between these two characters ever since they decided there should be a difference between these two characters. And yet only one of them brings it up. They told me the world only makes sense if you force it to. And then it goes unanswered and doesn't matter anyway because this version of Superman doesn't have any coherent philosophical underpinning, which we're going to talk about in just a moment right after we reaffirm the main cause of them fucking up this fight scene. For no reason at all. Instead of coming up with something that fit the tone and narrative of the movie itself, they adapted the one from The Dark Knight Returns in an act of pathetic, desperate hope that this level of blatant fanboy pandering could pull their embattled franchise out of its cultural death spiral. And it doesn't work at all. In fact, it does the opposite. The Dark Knight Returns was a satirical deconstructionist work wherein everything about the aging psychopath Batman versus fascist government sellout Superman showdown is built around the tragic end result of these two former allies having both gone so far astray from the point where they were aligned as friends that they've looped back around to face each other as enemies, visualized through Superman's increasingly caricatured proportions and Batman's everything Batman is not in physical form suit of armor. They borrowed the visuals and setup of a story that was designed to deconstruct the characters and satirize the genre genre, tried to use it as the centerpiece of a dead serious narrative meant to iconify said characters and affirm the genre, and the end result feels exactly as wrong-headed and calamitous as taking space balls, cutting out the funny parts, and releasing what's left of it as Star Wars Episode Nine, because that's basically what they did here, and the idea that no one was apparently willing or able to discern the fairly obvious litany of reasons that this idea was fatally flawed from the get-go ultimately means that serious questions must be asked of the people making these decisions. How many assholes we got on this ship anyhow? Yo! In this case, one person in particular must be held to account, meaning that the time has come to turn the critical eye onto the man who, at least at one point, had the plan. Zack Snyder is a great director, full stop, no qualifications. He has a good eye for detail, a strong sense of scene geography, a genuine skill for framing and grasp of visual as narrative that far exceeds many of his better regarded peers, particularly those who tend to attach themselves to more attainable, less risky projects. Let's be very clear about that last part because it's something that gets lost in the consideration of many modern filmmakers' work because we've become overly inured to the idea of mainstream Hollywood genre film as being an inherently risk-proof venture. Whatever you may think of the individual films themselves, Zack Snyder's directorial filmography is entirely comprised of projects that were significant financial and creative risks. 
works, not just in terms of the way he opted to make them, but in the DNA of each film's conception. Even more impressively, the most consistent risk among them is to his own artistic reputation. He would appear, from the perspective of a neutral observer, to have deliberately sought out movie projects where, even if the finished film were to be successful, he would almost certainly become villainized target of ridicule for a not insignificant portion of the audience. He made his debut directing a remake of Dawn of the Dead, one of the most well-established classics of the horror genre whose mere prospect of being remade was guaranteed to draw the ire of passionate fans, a seeming no-win situation if ever there was one. 300 openly antagonized not only political commentators thanks to its faithful translation of Frank Miller's deeply uncomfortable obsession with dehumanizing historic Middle Eastern characters while simultaneously valorizing icons of Western patriarchy through celebratory quasi-fascist neoclassical military mythmaking, it also practically invited historians to draw their knives on Miller's preposterous revisionism. Watchmen was considered not only unfilmable on a practical level, but to many fans something that it would be sacrilege to even attempt. There's probably no universe where the owls of Gahul ever looked like a sherbet. And of course, whatever you think of the result, Sucker Punch is one of the most audacious and recognizably personal films a director of his caliber has ever convinced a major studio to release at that point in his career. A densely layered film of ideas and meditations that aims all at once to be an exploration of cinematic language, a manifesto on visual and thematic representations of gender, sexuality, and the feminine form in contemporary genre film, a deconstruction and celebration of genre differentiation, a representational argument between generational schools of both 1960s feminist theory, and a repository for a succession of unmistakably specific visual tableaus that had clearly been scrambling to break free from the director's fertile imagination for years. I say again for clarity, irrespective of your opinion on the film itself, alone puts a lie to the idea of Snyder as some kind of hack. Regardless of execution, hacks do not make that kind of personal introspective work, and certainly don't lay themselves out on the altar to be lashed at over it. That's what makes them hacks. Remember, ladies, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Even his transition to, for a little while anyway, overseer of the so-called DC Extended Universe was a profound risk, particularly to his own clout and credibility, which, as we've just discussed, he also cashed in the bulk of once before. Filmmakers have been trying for over three decades to pull Superman out from under the shadow of Christopher Reeve and Richard Donner, and everyone who's tried has not only been widely judged a failure, but seen their career suffer a setback because of it. The only thing more guaranteed to be a thankless job poorly received was to be the first filmmaker to try their hand at Batman after Christopher Nolan had finished with the property. And not only did Snyder sign on to do both, he attached his subsequent fortunes, in multiple senses of the word, to a fast-track Justice League movie that even under the best circumstances was almost certainly destined, fairly or not, to be received as an also-ran in comparison to the defining blockbuster of this decade, aka The Avengers. <laughs> Suffice to say, Zack Snyder is not a bad filmmaker, even if this particular case he happens to have been one of the parties most responsible for an extremely bad film. But, since his work on that extremely bad film is about to be highlighted in very explicit detail, I figured it was incumbent to mention that up front, where it wouldn't be drowned out amid the overwhelmingly more negative stuff. That having been said, Trying to retroactively psychoanalyze Zack Snyder in the wake of this thing has become something of a cottage industry among film critics, mostly because he'd previously made the kind of films that the critical press didn't typically think of as coming from a place of philosophical consideration until cultural build-up forces their hand, and now they're in a rush to catch up. And honestly, a lot of it struck me as a little bit forced and creepy, largely born of having seen the genre film dominated by filmmakers of similar background and influence for so long that when someone seems to come along with a noticeably alternative perspective, the model doesn't know how to process it. I acknowledge this up front because, yeah, I do think he's a very talented filmmaker, and I still feel a bit conflicted about kicking the shit out of his movie while he and his family are likely still in a period of mourning, and it's entirely possible that my best efforts to avoid doing so will fail, and I'll end up making bullshit analytical presumptions of my own here regardless. So, apologies for that in advance. No one stays good in this world. In any case, many who went looking for some kind of clue as to what would compel a filmmaker with a pretty solid body of work under his belt beforehand to decide to make something like Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice soon settled on a 2008 interview with Entertainment Weekly conducted in tandem with the release of Watchmen as a kind of Rosetta Stone for Snyder's views on the superhero genre. And while if there's one thing I've learned when it comes to understanding auteur filmmakers is that there's never just one specific key to unlocking everything, it's definitely a compelling artifact all the same. This is of course the same interview where Snyder talked up the possibility of a Captain America movie as a kind of ridiculous point-of-no-return concept for the genre, and infamously rejected the notion that the Nolan Batman movies were dark because in his version, Batman could get raped in prison. But what stands out less sensationally but more substantively are the earlier bits where the director describes his actual experience and background in the genre and how he came to Watchmen, painting a picture of a decidedly different development as a consumer of the medium than many of his contemporaries that feels increasingly more important to understanding the results that many likely assumed in the beginning. 
all downhill from here, down to the floodplain, farm at the bottom of the world. Specifically, whereas the majority of late period Baby Boomer and Gen X comics fans, including those who went on to become comic creators, geek media personalities, or filmmakers in their own right, tend to tell a story of either being drawn back to or reinvigorated as fans of superhero comics by Alan Moore's work after having already grown up marinating in the traditional versions of the genre in their youth. Snyder, on the other hand, describes himself as having been largely uninterested in the more innocent classical superhero fare as a younger man. Instead, his artistic and creative taste lean more in the direction of darker, visceral, sexually charged genre fare exemplified by the high fantasy art of Frank Frazetta, and in terms of comics, specifically the groundbreaking anthology Heavy Metal. As such, he describes the quote-unquote normal superhero comics as something he was never able to connect with, until he came upon Watchmen, which was just right and suited his sensibilities perfectly. Now, I happen to think Watchmen is a great movie, and that in part, because it's such a literal adaptation, it gets across most of what Moore's original comic was trying to get across just by adhering to the metaphors, analogies, and philosophical points that he baked into the narrative and mythology. That having been said, there's always been a slightly nagging sense among myself and others that even though Snyder got the message across by faithfully translating it, certain aspects, surprisingly no not leaving out the damn squid, that were different in certain respects, like the fight scenes being staged as cool instead of ugly and horrifying, easing back on what kind of publication the new frontiersman actually is, playing much of Rorschach's backstory vague and softening some of the uglier aspects of his monologue, well, things like that sort of suggested that maybe Snyder didn't fully get Watchmen in the way its author had intended. He calls my arrival the dawn of the superhero. I am not sure if I know what that means. And there's no way to make that sound not dickish on my part. I acknowledge, fine, oh, you just didn't get it, is nine times out of ten a dismissive way to suggest that someone would agree with your interpretation of this or that thing if only they were more intelligent. True. But I also contend that it's entirely possible to be highly intelligent and still miss the intended point of a work because it's aimed at an audience with a background or life experience different from your own, or because you yourself view the world through such a profoundly different lens that it simply doesn't penetrate the filter of your sensibilities unaltered. And that is the context in which I think it's entirely fair to ask if Zack Snyder truly understands Watchmen, and if not, what that says about his foray into mainstream superhero narratives afterwards. <laughs> I heard Joe. Because here's the thing about Watchmen. It's satirical, but unlike other dressing downs of the genre like Kick-Ass, Howard the Duck, or even The Dark Knight Returns in its own way, Watchmen isn't really funny. It's a straight-up tragedy with very little in the way of farce. It's also a lot more specific in its targeting than most people realize. While the finished product indeed attempts to cast its blanket of condemnation on the whole of the superhero comics landscape, Alan Moore originally started out with the intent of deconstructing a very specific corner of it. In 1983, DC Comics had purchased the right to a stable of moderately well-known Silver Age superheroes belonging to the defunct Charlton Comics publishing operation. Most notably, a set of characters created and or co-created by one-time Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko, The Question, Captain Atom, Nightshade, and the second incarnation of Blue Beetle, along with Blue Beetle No. 1, Thunderbolt, and Peacemaker, who'd been created by other people. Moore, working then directly at DC, conceived a story that would have used these Charlton heroes as the players in a pitch-dark, epic-scale deconstruction of the entire superhero genre, similar to themes he'd previously explored in his revival of Marvel Man, aka Miracle Man, back in the UK. DC wanted the book, but they also wanted to still eventually integrate the Charlton heroes into the mainstream DC universe. So Moore renamed and further redesigned his already satirically reimagined versions into Rorschach, Dr. Manhattan, Silk Spectre, Night Owl, Ozymandias, and The Comedian, ultimately creating Watchmen. My new world demands less obvious heroism. Your 
schooled by heroics are redundant. Now, what's notable about the Charlton heroes in their original pre-DC form is that they were mainly well known in their 1960s heyday as including some of the only explicitly politically themed characters in the genre at the time. Particularly in the cases of The Question and Blue Beetle, Ditko utilized his characters and story as direct, unapologetic mouthpieces for his deeply held commitment to the political philosophy of objectivism, a subset of right-wing conservatism founded by Atlas Shrugged author Ayn Rand that had long placed Ditko outside the mainstream of 60s comic book creators and and a sizable amount of the teen and college audience that Marvel had begun to core in the same era and which Alan Moore is definitely on the far-flung other side of. Hence why Watchmen divides its ire between savaging the very idea of costume vigilantes as a force for justice and decency, while also specifically framing them as avatars of Nixonian, Thatcherite, and or Reaganite authoritarianism, and inflexible binary moral judgmentalism, and also why the question, in Ditko's hands, a crusading journalist who tells people the truth they don't want to hear and confounds his enemies with the power of his unbending sense of right and wrong, becomes Rorschach, a diminutive, filthy, mentally unstable, sexually stunted vagrant who nonetheless thinks he's better than everyone else, gets off on brutality, and also happens to be a vile, homophobic, misogynist bigot who hero worships the flag-waving rapist comedian and entrusts his life story to the Watchmen universe equivalent of Breitbart News. All those liberals and intellectuals and smooth talkers. Now, the absence of some of those finer details vis-a-vis -vis Rorschach is not actually someone you're supposed to like, none of these assholes are, but especially not him. The first Silk Spectre is a bloated, aging whore. This awful city, it screams like an abattoir full of retarded children. Even Adrian Veidt, possible homosexual being either scrubbed or sanded down in Snyder's adaptation would suggest at least a little bit that either he didn't fully grasp that Rorschach isn't the badass good guy of the story and wanted to make him more palatable, or that he does grasp it but disagrees with Moore's take on the overall outlook and took it upon himself to offer an alternative vision. I don't know if I'm fully on board with either reading, but if you were looking for evidence to that effect, Snyder does seem to have a definite reoccurring infinity for heroes positioned as rugged, radical individualists standing up to both the weak and the antagonistic, plus he's been trying to get Warner Brothers to let him make a movie of Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead for the past few years between DC projects, and that happens to be a work that even more so than the better-known Atlas Shrugged fits rather comfortably with an outlook that would hold up. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Be their hero. Be their monument. Be their angel. Be anything they need you to be. Maybe. Or be none of it. You don't know this world. As moral wisdom and reason criticism of unilateral actions of the powerful by birthright turns out to be propaganda spread by nefarious enemies out of jealousy as a key plot point, so yeah, I guess that's a fair reading if you want to make it. The Fountainhead, incidentally, is an allegorical treatise on individualism and the rights of the artist. It tells the story of Howard Rourke, the world's greatest and most visionary architect who finds himself blocked from the success he deserves by a public that rejects his radical, forward-thinking designs, and thusly a lack of clients willing to agree to his complete term of creative autonomy. Why, oh why, will people not just get out of his way and let him do what he is objectively the best person in the world suited to do? Ultimately, though, Rourke discovers that the public resistance to his bettering the world through his superior architecture skills is not actually genuine. Rather, the gullible masses have been misled by the insidious propaganda spread by an all-powerful architecture critic yes, all-powerful architecture critic, Ellsworth Toohey, who believes that Rourke's genius and exceptionalism are a dangerous presence that threatens the order of the ordinary world and has undertaken an elaborate, years-long conspiracy to turn the public against him. So, yeah. Good joke. Everybody laugh. Roll on snare drum. Curtis. But what's more interesting to me in terms of how he approaches Watchmen is that the mythos of its alternate history is largely missing the key element of comic books themselves outside of the reuse of the Black Freighter comic in the expanded edition. One of the key building blocks to Moore's universe in the Watchmen comic is that the history of their world is identical to ours right up until the publication of Superman in 1938. In our reality, that leads to dozens and dozens of superheroes being created in comics to cash in on the craze, but in the Watchmen universe, it inspired actual people to become costume crime fighters and 
instead, leading to a dystopian present where superhero comics aren't even a thing anymore, and the real world superheroes are a bunch of degenerate assholes who end up alternately carrying out or failing to prevent an act of mass murder that permanently scars the world in the name of peace. To me, what's always been the most absurdly damning thing about Watchmen and the way the regular comics industry and fandom reacted to it was the way that they decided that all regular superheroes also now had to become grim and gritty deconstructions of themselves in order to follow its lead. Watchmen was an argument against itself. It sets itself up as a visualization of the oldest and most earnest of all fanboy wish dream questions, what if superheroes were real, and answers in the negative. It would suck because instead of being in comics as characters who can inspire us, they'd be out here as real people who can only ever let us down. A flabby failure who sits whimpering in his basement. And Zack Snyder, whatever else you can say about him, definitely appears, by his own description, to be very much among those who first looked at Watchmen and saw an instruction manual instead of a warning. Maybe through philosophical difference, maybe through coming to it without much working background in the material it was satirizing, but an interpretation far afield from the original intent all the same. And while, let me be clear about this, I don't believe at all that this indicates he's somehow not smart enough to get it, or that possibly holding certain socio-political views should disqualify him from making these films or any films, I do think it's reasonable to ask if either failing or refusing to grasp something like Watchmen as satire and arguments against the very world it presents helps to explain why one might also not register the cognitive dissonance in using another satirical deconstructionist work like The Dark Knight Returns as the straightforward basis for a movie about the very characters and universe it was deconstructing. Not every storyteller is ideally suited to tell every story, even extremely talented storytellers with substantial skill sets. Apart from all of the other more shallow, surface-level criticisms about design, cinematography, plot points, costumes, etc. aimed at Zack Snyder as a one-time foundational architect of the entire cinematic extension of the DC Comics universe, is it not worth asking if a filmmaker whose takeaway from a work that rather explicitly conveys a message of, this is horrifying and tragic, superheroes should not be like this, was, hey, this is awesome, the whole genre absolutely should be just like this, is perhaps not the ideal voice to be guiding the fate of your globally popular family entertainment franchise precisely because it might end up as a pretentious three-hour R-rated deconstruction that feels calculated to alternately confuse, bore, or traumatize your most important long-term audience? I mean, that makes sense to me, but hey, just a thought. Wasn't my money getting spent. I'm only ruining my half. And about that word deconstruction. I've used the phrase cultural vandalism to describe Batman v Superman's approach to its characters and mythos while admittedly incendiary, I do genuinely believe that it fits, particularly when it comes to Superman. From my perspective, taking a concept that was designed to inspire hope and optimism for an audience predominantly of children and reworking it into a grim, mindlessly violent spectacle of hopeless nihilism that may or may not also function as a treatise on the moral rightness of unilateral selfishness for the superior is totally of a kind with mocking public figures, caricaturing politicians, submerging religious symbols in Europe burning a national flag, yeah, I would compare the production of this film as it relates to Superman to all of those acts. That should be upside down. Now, we know better now, don't we? The devils don't come from hell beneath us, no. No, they come from the sky. But I would also say that those acts, however offensive they might be to certain folks' sensibilities, are absolutely okay things to do in terms of free expression and completely valid as artistic statements. Thus, as it should go without saying, Snyder, Goyer, and all the rest of them deciding to make this film with these characters in this way is their right in terms of free expression and an artistically valid statement all the way through. It's just also a shallow, pointless, and really, really stupid artistic statement because it's empty and scatterbrained and doesn't actually state anything beyond Look at me! And while you're not required to have something to say with an act of cultural vandalism, I do feel like you kinda should when the thing you're vandalizing is this storied and this important to so many people. Not because of some high-minded ideal about art always having a duty to build up the human spirit and give us ideals to strive for, which I don't believe, or because I've got some kind of axe to grind against postmodernism, which I don't, and which if I did it would be kind of hard to square with this feature-length evisceration of a film from the modern blockbuster cinema's most prominent neoclassicalist, it's really coming from a much simpler place. If you're gonna break all the toys in the toy box, I feel like you should at least have a coherent reason to do so. Creative demolition is a thing, but it generally requires a purpose. This may be the only thing I do.
One of my favorite movies is Paul Verhoeven's version of Starship Troopers, which is an adaptation of a prototypical youth-targeted military science fiction novel by Robert Heinlein. And in this case, adaptation ends up meaning a brutal, deliberate, systematic dismantling, pulverizing, and mocking of the literal source material and everything that it or its author ever stood for. Verhoeven and screenwriter Ed Neumeyer break Heinlein's story and characters down to their base elements, reconstitute them as walking parodies of their individual character types, slather the production design of the good guys, world, iconography, and political system with explicit references to Nazi Germany, and present the entire thing not simply as a matter-of-fact depiction of a fascist state. This year we explored the failure of democracy, how the social scientists brought our world to the brink of chaos. We talked about the veterans, how they took control, and imposed the stability that has lasted for generations since. But as the kind of propaganda movie that a fascist state would absolutely make about itself to valorize its imperial military endeavors, right down to casting the heroes with cartoonishly model gorgeous young actors and actresses of, let's say, limited dramatic range. Captain Carmen Abanez. This is the captain speaking. All personnel prepare for drop. Soldiers like Private Ace Levy and Lieutenant John Rico. Come on, you ape! You wanna live forever? The subtextual message of Starship Troopers the movie is that Starship Troopers the book is bullshit. It is without a doubt one of the most staggeringly mean-spirited things that an artist has ever done to another artist or their work, but it was all undertaken for an artistic purpose. Verhoeven, as far back as Robocop and Total Recall, has used the medium of science fiction to critique particularly American power fantasies about heroic and righteous militarism so popular within the genre, and in Troopers, he took it upon himself to deliver a scathing critique of Heinlein's acknowledged upfront and very successful attempt to inject the mythology of armed service making boys into men that was key to his personal belief system into the soul of the sci-fi genre, while also delivering one of the most kick-ass action films of the late 90s, the ultimate proof of concept for satire as adaptation in my humble opinion. Young people from all over the globe are joining up to fight for the future. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part, too. <laughs> Batman v Superman feels very much like something made in that kind of mindset. It presents its iconic characters alternately as debased versions of themselves or walking evidence of their incompatibility with the real or modern world. Its Superman is a detached brooding loner whose alien side's godlike omniscience seems to eliminate rather than increase his ability to empathize. Huh. and whose human side is informed not by idealized small-town wisdom, but by embittered, narrow-minded selfishness. Its Batman is a killer, a sadist, and a literal xenophobe driven by hatred and paranoid delusions, going back to the central metaphor, Affleck and Snyder's Batman is the superhero version of a guy who stockpiles weapons so he can kill people who don't belong here because he was angry and frightened by 9-11. Oh, and he's also apparently a drunk. Oh, I hope the next generation of Waynes won't inherit an empty wine cellar. Its Lois Lane serves no purpose but to mourn, its Mon Pa Kent are selfish dicks with terrible life advice, its Perry White doesn't seem to care much about journalism, its Jimmy Olsen... Its Lex Luthor is an incoherently conceived grab bag of weak jabs at contemporary corporate stereotypes, its Doomsday is an empty, meaningless revival of something that almost meant something in a previous movie, and its entire thematic arc about the implicitly messianic character whose symbolism drenched death would indicate that this has mostly been his story revolves around whether or not the little people of the world are embracing his good deeds with enough unquestioning enthusiasm to make it worth his while to continue saving them. It's a dark mirror of the classically understood DC Comics universe that presents the characters therein at their most unlikable, for seemingly no other purpose than to show they can be made unlikable. And all that is before it breaks out a full-blown homage to the most iconic deconstruction of Batman and Superman ever published, and before its director summed up the negative reaction to all of this by opining, well, people don't like seeing their heroes deconstructed. How does it feel to be deconstructed? To be the victim? To watch your dreams die. But is this even a deconstruction at all? What does Zack Snyder, who may or may not have spent an enormous amount of time, energy, and attention to detail bringing Watchmen to the screen without recognizing the satiric purpose behind that story's deconstructionism, think deconstruction means in this case? What is the point being made? What inner truth is being exposed by deconstructing everything? What new foundation is being built on the rubble of the temple that's been demolished? Heavenly God, creator of heaven and earth, Mercy on my soul.
Batman v Superman writes itself a license to climb to the highest point in town with enough spray paint to write whatever it wants for the entire world to see, but it has nothing to actually say, and all that comes out is gibberish. Vandalism without purpose and without meaning, but still carried out on a scale that may be impossible to repair in a reasonable time frame. What a pointless, senseless, mindless waste. Could it have been any different? <sighs> You're really gonna make me do it, aren't you? Okay. Okay, so on one of my other shows, In Bob We Trust, occasionally features a segment wherein I pitch around on how to fix either movies that didn't work or movie projects that have trouble happening in the first place. Some folks have suggested that I should try and apply that template to Batman v Superman if I'm going to declare myself the expert on what does and doesn't work about it. And okay, I'm not 100% sure that I have declared that, but well, yeah, having watched this thing now more time than I've probably watched anything I liked at this point, yeah, I do feel like I've hit on more or less a couple ideas of how to make it better. Understand, I'm not saying that there was some magic bullet simple fix that would have made Batman v Superman a good movie. If you're asking me what I would do to create what I would have considered a wholly satisfying film out of this mess, well, that would involve a complete teardown and rebuild of the whole DCEU machinery, and I already did a pair of videos about that. The question here is whether or not there was anything that could have been done to make Batman v Superman itself work, specifically working as a functioning version of what it's actually trying to be, using the assets that are already in place and not adding anything else as some kind of special seasoning or a cheat. And while I don't think it would have resulted in anything like a great film, or even a film I'd particularly enjoy myself, yeah, I think there was a way forward, with two simple words. No Batman. Seriously, that would be the key change I'd make. Lose Batman, lose Bruce Wayne, lose the V, lose all of it. Not because I'm sick of Batman or to dunk on Ben Affleck, but because it simply fixes one of the huge structural problems. This film has effectively three main characters, but two of them have basically the same story and the same role in that story. Batman v Superman is a movie about an alien superhero whose continued presence on Earth as an all-powerful do-gooder has led people to increasingly question what that presence actually means for the future of humanity itself, and who is targeted for elimination by a rich man with a traumatic childhood who fears that he might use his powers to subjugate the human race, and another rich man with a traumatic childhood who fears he might use his powers to subjugate the human race. Yes, one of them is ultimately revealed to be playing the other, but otherwise they're too similar and the story gets longer and more complicated to fit them both in, but also more bloated and boring because we keep repeating redundant story points for both Bruce Wayne and Lex Luthor. Easiest way to solve that? Don't do the crossover. Save Batman for another time and focus on this as a proper Man of Steel Part 2. <laughs> Now, I know what you're thinking, okay, but doesn't that just leave us with less convoluted but also less high-stakes movie since now it's only Space Jesus versus the Evil Doctor Facebook? Well, not exactly. Remember, I said you get rid of Batman, but not Batman's storyline. See where I'm going? Exactly. You take all the Batman-specific details out of the equation, and you take all the remaining Bruce Wayne stuff and make it Lex Luthor stuff. It's cherry. Like I said, I'm looking at fixing this while adhering to the established intent of this film and its predecessor as dark, hypothetically complex, revisionist deconstructions of the Superman mythos. And what more impactful statement of revisionist intent could you make, what deconstructionist flag could you plant more profoundly, than to not only frame Superman saving Metropolis from General Zod as a 9-11 reminiscent tragic disaster, but to have our on-the-ground hero of the people, this bold, philanthropic capitalist hero who charges into the dust storm to save as many lives as he can and swears vengeance on the uncaring godlike beings who who caused all of this be Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor, the greatest criminal mind of our time. Of our time? I hereby serve notice. He's serving those to you. That these walls, these walls here. Will you shut up, please? What? A character whose name is universally associated with evil as Superman is with good. And you don't stop there. You give him all the stuff Bruce has in this movie, the charisma, the likability, the at least initially sympathetic rationale for the extremes he goes to, the brave one-on-one -on -one, do you bleed confrontations with Superman himself. Hell, you can even keep the handsome charm and the CrossFit bro stuff. In fact, keep Affleck and have him play Luther. Yes, with the biceps and the slick suits and the chiseled jaw and the Head full of perfectly just for men hair, basically a Zack Snyder version of the self-made ideal man Lex Luthor from All-Star Superman, the guy who was physically fit as he was brilliant and resented Superman for being born strong instead of working for it. Sexy Lexi, sure, why not? You want to talk deconstructing a mythology? You want to talk subversive? Lex Luthor, as an aspirational figure we like and whose point of view we can see opposite Cable's cold, detached, brooding Superman, is subversive as hell. Plus, I sort of get the sense that a character like this might be really up Zack Snyder's alley and that his overall worldview might make him better suited to sympathizing with a character like this than other filmmakers might be. Can you imagine a better world, Kent? Mm, that's all I've ever asked. In a world without Superman.
The unattainable Lois Lane might have noticed good old Clark. <laughs> Next to Superman, even Lex Luthor's greatness is overshadowed. Are you trying to intimidate me? I'm trying to educate you. We all fall short of his sickening, inhuman perfection. Feel that, Kent. Real muscle. Not the gift of alien biochemistry, the product of hard work. I mean, if the whole point of Man of Steel and this was to reimagine Superman's specific moral compass evolving over time through experience rather than just being fully developed by the time he leaves from Metropolis thanks to his good upbringing, maybe having an encounter with a villain who challenges this outlook and actually raises good points before turning out to be the villain is the logical place to end that particular through line. And you can go all the way with it. You ride it for as long as you can that maybe Lex has a point, you give him the nightmare scene and tie it into all that stuff he's learning from the the exposition spaceship, then for the kickoff of Act 3, you have Lois probably discover that Lex has been manipulating things to justify what he's already decided to do. Instead of a fight with Batman and Superman, it's Superman versus Lex in the strength-enhancing war suit. Lex loses, probably goes bald too. Plan B is Doomsday, cue the rest of the movie. Wonder Woman is probably also still there. Sure, Superman dies, let's get ready for Justice League. How many of you are there? Not enough. Again, would this have magically made it a good movie? I mean, maybe. A lot of it would still be execution dependent, but at the very least, it would be more streamlined, focused, not quite so overlong. And even if it was just only okay, that might have been enough to not set off the shockwave of chaos that led to Justice League being such a compromised Frankensteinian mess, and maybe Warner Brothers wouldn't be trying to do the franchise reboot equivalent of changing tracks at full speed right now. But, to be clear, I wouldn't presume that I actually had the answer to fixing this movie that hundreds of highly skilled professionals who worked on it somehow missed. That's always the subtext underlining the ironic arrogance of the whole how I'd fix it concept. Sure, it might make sense that why is this bat person even in the movie, it's redundant, get rid of him, would be the first thing a story editor might say about this, but that's not how it works. They decided Batman was going to be in this movie likely before pen ever touched paper. There are always multiple competing visions and studio notes and things that just have to be in there. It's baked into the experience when you sign up to make one of these. That's the main reason so few of them turn out to be transcendently great films, and why it's a big deal when you do get a Spider-Man 2 or a Civil War or The Last Jedi or whatever, and that needs to be acknowledged, even as I didn't want to head into the home stretch without at least some constructive criticism. Don't invent a conspiracy theory to put back his halo. Also, hey, look at that! It's the home stretch! And so at last, we come to a summation. What the hell happened here? How best to describe it? Well, some people wanted to make a movie, a whole lot of questionable decisions were made in succession, and the end result was a disaster. A film about as bad as a film can be and still have been executed with basic levels of competence, with the possible exception of whoever signed off on that whole jar of piss thing. But the fact of the matter is, if the experience of tracking back through all of this has taught me anything, it's that there wasn't any one thing that did the project in, or any one thing that could have changed to make it all work out. For example, yeah, it's pretty clear Zack Snyder was probably not the one who should have been in charge of setting so much of the tone and foundation for this whole experiment given his overall approach to the material, but who's to say his sensibilities wouldn't have resulted in an even worse film if he was doing a gun-for-hire job and adhering to a pre-established tone and setup that he didn't really believe in? Besides, just because you or I may not care for Snyder's view of these characters doesn't mean that under different circumstances he couldn't have created a good version of what he was trying to do here. I mean, remember when Disney did a remake of one of their most famous older movies and they made it into a metaphorical rape-revenge movie? where it turned out the story we knew was a lie and the villain was actually the hero the whole time? I mean, that's way more out than anything going on here, and that movie was pretty good, and a pretty big hit, too. Again, execution is basically everything. Likewise, sure, it's easy to look at that famous years-old quote from David Goyer about how Batman v Superman is the movie you make when you've run out of ideas and conclude maybe it could have used a different writer, but I hate to burst your bubble, kids, screenwriting is a job and you don't only get to work on the projects you're 100% enthusiastic about. Should they not have hired Ben Affleck because Daredevil proved he wasn't cut out for the genre? Maybe, but that was a long time ago and you can't exactly blame a studio for not trying to match one of their top creative assets with one of their top IP assets. Should someone have considered back before Man of Steel that 
Maybe there's more to playing Superman than a strong jawline and filling out the spandex? I mean, ideally, sure, but on the other hand, right now, the performance that's saving this entire franchise is comprised almost completely of attitude, personality, poise, and sometimes that's really enough with these things. From where I sit, when you clear away all the incidental problems, the real issues at play in both Batman v Superman and the universe it was supposed to set up, the two are frankly inseparable from one another at this point, came from the top down and before that, deep within the core of the animating philosophy driving all of this from its very inception. And I think it's fair to posit that those issues are so pronounced and insurmountable that an entirely different creative team might have assembled an entirely different version of this movie, and it still would have been in just a different flavor of bad. Batman v Superman and the DC Extended Universe were both broken long before either of them had a name, and what was broken about them comes almost entirely from Warner Brothers having spent well over a decade approaching the DC properties from an entirely reactionary standpoint. Man of Steel faltered in large part because more emphasis was placed on reacting to people's criticism of Superman Returns, i.e. not enough action, too much reverence for the Donner movies, not as dark or complex as those Nolan Batman movies, etc. Batman v Superman, likewise, itself was hampered by having to pay for Man of Steel's perceived mistakes, from the often garish visual palette to the mountains of extraneous DC fan service to the Hail Mary pass of calling Batman back into service, almost certainly way, way too soon after Christopher Nolan and Christian Bale had put their version to bed in a way that felt calculated to force the studio not to dredge it back up until the world was good and ready. And all of it buckles further under the weight of studio expectations that leads to embarrassing sequences like the Nightmare and Lex Luthor's DCEU electronic press kit. Here we see laid bare an indifference to quality and truly staggering cynicism on Warner Brothers' part of the type that just got done scuttling Universal's Dark Universe slate after a single bad movie and, if we're being honest, probably should have scuttled at least this version of this one and, you know, might still if Flashpoint actually gets made and turns out to be a reboot, so stay tuned for that. Warner Brothers was so fixated on measuring up to the Disney Marvel project in the eyes of their investment and shareholders that they, and pretty much the whole rest of Hollywood currently stumbling along the same path, managed to get the whole goddamn thing backwards. The promise of a franchise doesn't sell people on movies. Movies sell people on the promise of a franchise. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. And because of that, we have Batman v Superman, a narratively stunted, ideologically incoherent film with some of the most screen time but the least to say in its whole genre about a clash that doesn't need to happen between two heroes whose differences are too muddled to care about and whose enemy makes even less thematic sense than they do, that repeatedly sacrifices its own story to set up characters and concepts we have no reason to care about and wants us to invest in an outcome we cannot understand, not in terms of plot, but in terms of theme. Even before the final movie rolled around, the goal of the Avengers was conceivable because everything that had been done leading up to it had been about emphasizing the same central theme of individuals who thought themselves better suited to and or cursed to be on their own, recognizing the need to build and maintain family, surrogate, or otherwise. Now four films in, what kind of similar crescendo are we supposedly building to in Justice League coming out of the wrap-up of Batman v Superman? What actually dawned in the dawn of justice? Not enough. If there isn't a more compelling answer than getting to see everyone standing next to each other at some point, well, then maybe Flashpoint can't get here soon enough. Man, I really wish I had a stronger summation for all of this. Almost as much as I wish you probably couldn't tell that my voice is almost gone by now. I wish I could wrap the whole thing up into some kind of grand unifying thesis, like, and that's why if we're going to make superheroes like the Justice League or Avengers the, for lack of a better or more appropriate phrase, the new gods of our popular culture, we should all probably put more thought into what telling these stories actually means. Which is true, but doesn't fully connect to the more technical nuts and bolts stuff. Righteous philosophical intentions are not the same thing as narrative coherency and storytelling ability. Go watch the two sequels to The Matrix or the Star Wars prequels for proof of that. I also really wish it could be summed up as an indictment of the mania for cinematic universes and how the quirk of fate in one studio pulling it off mostly without any major speed bumps and the over-representation of fanboy voices with dubious priorities in regards to overall quality has led them to forget that such things are made of good stories more than they are connective tissue. But as much as I do want much of Hollywood to learn that lesson, and soon, preferably before I'm struggling to explain in vain that the Transformers movies didn't suddenly turn good because Rom, Matt Tracker, and 
Pinkie Pie turned up to talk about a situation on the planet Prismos, that doesn't fully encapsulate the problem either. Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is a project that died bleeding and screaming from a thousand cuts, most of them inflicted by corporate greed, some at the hands of wrong-headed or poorly matched creatives, but most by an overall indifference and incompetence. It's true that too many people put too many competing expectations onto this film, but what matters is that being a good movie didn't seem to be anywhere near the top of anyone's demands. It's a train wreck, a tragedy, a black mark on dozens of careers, a new low in the genre that's seen more than its share, and a genuinely obscene waste of money, time, resources, and artistic credibility, but with everything weighed against it, how can it be anything but? Take a bucket of piss and call it Granny's peach tea. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, having a movie be as badly received as this one, and costing as much as this did, might not end careers, but it would definitely end plans, or at least significantly alter them. How could it not? But since, in a move that will likely not be repeated again many times more, the studio plowed ahead into production on three more films before finding out that their point of origin movie was one of the worst received films of that year, one of which turned out to be pretty good, one of which honestly kind of sounded like a questionable prospect before everybody hated Batman v Superman, and the third, well... Hey, so obviously this was written and recorded before Justice League had come out and became what it was, which was a bizarre mix of Zack Snyder's Everything is Wagner tonal aesthetic and Joss Whedon's Everything is a CW dramedy where everyone has the same cadence and point of reference tonal aesthetic, awkwardly Frankenstein together by a studio that had clearly abandoned all respect for either of them as artists, and also a very bad movie. A very, very bad DC Extended Universe movie. Regardless, the stuff that didn't work in Wonder Woman and may or may not have worked at some point throughout the calamitous production and reproduction of Justice League is pretty much all stuff that was already poisoned before they inherited it from Dawn of Justice, and it's not hard to imagine that this will end up being the case with Aquaman 2. The DC Extended Universe train, or whatever we're going to rebrand it as, has already left the station, and even if it's holding together now, I'm sorry, everything I've managed to glean from having immersed myself so completely in the fetid bowels of Batman v Superman tells me that the myriad cracks and profound design flaws in the engine are still going to blow the whole thing off the rails sooner or later if it maintains its current course. Can it be saved? I think so, yeah. I mean, that depends on what you mean by saved. If you're asking, will I ever see DC Comics movies again? The answer is of course. I feel like we're way past the point where this genre is meaningfully going away. The time period between Batman and Robin killing the superhero genre and the genre itself being zapped back to life by Blade was just one year. Time between Spider-Man 3 and Iron Man, also one year. You'll get your DC movies. Will they be part of the ongoing story established here? That's a little less of a guarantee. And if you're asking whether or not some narrative sleight of hand down the road, retcon is going to make rewatching Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Suicide Squad not a soul sucking waste of your time? No, that's not going to happen. And making it happen should be the last concern on anyone's mind. That kind of fixating on connective tissue and trying to make up for previous mistakes over in the moment quality storytelling is a big part of how we got into this mess. Which is why, even if, yes, I'd totally mark out for some kind of serious multiversal fan service stuff like Ben Affleck meeting Christian Bale and Michael Keaton, or a digitally reconstituted Christopher Reeve showing up with the gray Earth 2 Superman temples, or a walk on from the Arrowverse people, I really hope they don't actually try to flashpoint their way into a fanboy pardon. Hey, so uh, obviously this portion of the monologue was also written and recorded way before Justice League officially belly flopped, as it now appears they are very much actually going to try and flashpoint their way into a fanboy pardon. God help us all. Because I want this stuff to work. I want these movies to not just be good, but great. I believe that this genre, at this moment in time, is playing a very important role in the emergence of a new and exciting global international cultural consciousness. Storytelling matters. Art matters. Entertainment matters. Movies matter. And figures like Batman, Superman, and all their friends and colleagues not only still matter, they probably matter more now than they ever did before. There was an idea. to bring together a group of remarkable people. To see if we could become something more. So when they needed us, we could fight the battles. That they never could. But 
we do them, ourselves, and the world that so desperately needs them no favors by letting any of those things coast by on good enough because we're glad for a few edible morsels. Or worse, when we abdicate our ability to perceive what a work is because of our devotion to what we wish it were. For all those reasons and more, I hope you've understood why I found it so important to explore, understand, and at last firmly acknowledge why Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice was really that bad. Today is a day for truth. What are you looking at? Hey gang, here's a question that keeps coming up. If your handle is Movie Bob, where are your movie reviews? Well, my old reviews are in a lot of places. You'll find many of them on my YouTube channel, but you'll find the brand new ones on Geek.com, an awesome site that's also your one-stop news source for science, TV, gaming, technology, nerd culture, the works. You can find all my reviews directly by going to Geek.com slash author slash B Chipman, because that's my real name, and you can get regular updates on all my reviews and all of Geek.com's other great content by signing up for their kick-ass newsletter at subscribe.geek.com. And don't forget to also subscribe to the Geek.com YouTube channel, where you'll find the videos that accompany my reviews and tons of other great content, too. Remember, that's Geek.com, the Geek.com newsletter, and Geek.com on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss out on all the latest Movie Bob reviews. You can also check out my own new website, Movie Bob Central, where you'll find my blog, links to all my work, and shop for my books, ebooks, and future Movie Bob products. And please remember to like these videos, share them with all of your friends, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching another Movie Bob production.